Professor Zeeb here. Welcome on in to another edition of a video lecture here, a developmental video that we're going to talk about here. So what we're going to uh, discuss this time is early adulthood, which technically is your late teens to about your, your 30s. So, you know, this is kind of an interesting chapter for y'all because obviously most of you are in that age range. So certainly it can apply to you personally in many different ways. And what we're going to discuss this time is uh, transitioning into adulthood. So now we go to this sort of time period uh, where it's late adolescence transitioning into adulthood and how that's sort of handled uh, throughout the world and even in our country and so forth. All right, so let's take a look here. So once again, we're talking early adulthood, late teens through 30s. So it turns out that uh, this transition phase here, which typically is around late teens, early 20s, uh, is thought to be sort of you know, almost held sacred in certain cultures. So we're going to look at initiation into adulthood. It turns out that adolescents throughout the world engage in these activities, these rites of passage, so to speak, to prove that they are ready uh, to reach adult status. So it's really interesting how different cultures handle this differently, including our own culture here in America. But let's give you some examples here. Uh, some certain rural nations out in Africa and Australia actually send their adolescents to a bush school, if you will, where they are tested physically, they're giving physical training, uh, they're disciplined and taught their tribal lore. Lore. So in other words, it's sort of preparing them for adulthood, you could argue. Other cultures may signify adult status through giving you a tattoo, for example, filing or blackening your teeth. Uh, some, some cultures actually give you a new name when you become an adult to show that official transition. But our most shopping, shocking example of this comes out of Africa, certain rural nations in Africa, where for all the young ladies in their culture, they actually perform a clitorectomy. In other words, they would uh, physically mutilate one of the most sensitive parts of the female body, the clitoris, of course. And this supposedly is done to prepare them for marriage and take the sensation out of intercourse. So I'm not really sure exactly all the sort of underpinnings behind that. But once again, it's considered to be a rite of passage that all these females in this culture go through. If you imagine that, just going through that, it's just an amazing, amazing example. A lot of these rites of passage serve certain purposes, and those include uh, allowing the adolescent to gain access to adult practices, uh, opening the door into a, the knowledge of that culture, for example, giving them the skills that they need to survive once they do become an adult. It's also done for sexual reasons. So theoretically, a lot of these rites of passage separate that uh, adolescent from their mother and their family potentially to get them ready to face the real world as an adult. So here in America, you know, we really don't do those things. You know, it's kind of interesting, different things that people do. Uh, but here in the United States, historically, marriage sort of served this purpose that once you got married, you're sort of free from the apron, spring, apron strings of your family, so to speak, and thus you could face the real world. So historically, marriage served that purpose, but it turns out that we really don't, I mean, even that, we don't have one initiation practice that every single uh, teenager has to go through to prove that they are ready for adulthood. So we don't have one thing. I mean, our country is kind of a strange one because we have so many different existing cultures all in one place with different backgrounds and different beliefs and religions and things like that. So we really don't have one thing that we all have to do. However, you could argue that several things that are sort of incorporated into our culture, into our culture serve that purpose. So we're going to look at some of those, right? So Remember, we're arguing here that these may be substitutes for some of those rites of passage that other countries perform. We're gonna put them in, in, into categories here. So we have the religious initiation activities. Now, once again, a lot of variation and diversity here. I'll give you one example. 
I don't know if you guys have ever been to a bar mitzvah, which is a really interesting and fun experience, but this comes out of the Jewish faith, where when the boy turns around age 13, so in this case, we're going to use boys as an example, they go through this whole process where they have to chant a portion of the Torah, for example. I remember I went to wine in high school, and uh, my friend uh, was Jewish, and he went through this, and he had to give a sermon uh, in the Hebrew language using the Torah and so forth. So it was kind of a big moment for him to sit up there in front of people, you know, as a 13-year-old nervous uh, teenager to do that. And then there's this big celebration that happens afterwards where the family's there, all the friends are there to really kind of honor and uh, show support that this person is now becoming a man, uh, technically. So it shows responsibility. It shows that they have uh, what it takes to become a successful member in that culture. So the bar mitzvah is a classic example. Many re religions have things built into them along those lines. Next, we go to physical and sexual practices. You know, a lot of different examples of this one. But I think, you know, to me, immediately what comes to mind is your first sexual encounter. Maybe the first time you have intercourse or involved uh, in a mature type sexual behavior. Uh, it's thought to be a, a pretty big moment in people's lives that, wow, you know, hey, I'm not quite a kid anymore. I'm, I'm doing these things. You know, potentially I could become a parent, which obviously makes you grow up very, very quickly. So that's just an example of that one. When people go through that, it may serve that sort of purpose. Social, once again, many different examples of this one. To me, you know, when the culture I'm from and sort of what I think of, would be the sweet 16 birthday party for girls. So I remember in high school, a lot of girls I knew uh, went through this where it's a big party and celebration when the girl becomes 16, it's a big deal. You know, it's showing that she's not quite a, a child anymore and becoming a young lady. I guess you could argue the quinceanera, which is obviously built into religion as well, uh, also serves that purpose. So many examples of the social one. Educational would be another example. So I think my example for this one would be getting your driver's license. Not everyone has to do that, obviously, but um, most people in our culture have to pass the driving test and the written test. And so we're saying that it's educational because obviously you have to study the driving laws and you have to prove that you understand those and know those and can perform uh, behind the wheel. So this would be an example of education. Obviously graduating high school, entering into college would also be examples of that. All right, and then finally economic. There's different economic uh, events in our life at this time that kind of serve the purpose of a rite of passage. This could be getting your first job, uh, paying bills for the first time, or maybe your parents did that your whole life up to this point. It, it could be getting your first bank account and your first checking account where you have to be responsible with your funds, which obviously is very adult in nature to be able to do that. So the point is, is that even though here in America, we don't have one thing that every single teen has to do, you, you could argue that these different things sort of serve that purpose, okay? Uh, so once again, these may be adequate substitutes to a certain extent that shows and proves that we're ready to face the adult world and be successful and be responsible. Okay, so we are going to move on next to the second half of the short lecture, which is related to this, and that is this concept of emerging adulthood that the textbook uh, discusses. <clears throat> so this would be that transition phase between 18 and 25, where it's pretty common here in America for teens to experiment with their identity, you know, their lifestyle, their career path, certainly other cultures. Uh, this could relate to other cultures as well. You know, for example, am I gonna remain single? Am I gonna go to college? You know, these decisions that you basically make uh, as a young adult or an emerging adult in this sense. So we're gonna kind of look at that specifically. All right, so here we go with emerging adulthood. A lot of this information comes from this gentleman, Jeffrey Arnett, in 2006, who wrote about this and researched this, so it's based on his findings. Mm -hmm. 
So emerging adulthood is a time of identity exploration, especially when it comes to love and work. In other words, when it comes to those things, many key changes happen, happen during this time of our life, whether it's moving out for the first time, establishing your career, uh, getting serious in a relationship, as an example. A lot of these sort of decisions are made during this time. However, when we look at the research here in America, many young adults establish a co-residence with their parents. That's pretty common. So according to the study by Cohen and others in 2003, they, they found that by age 25, so at the end of emerging adulthood here, still an early adult, obviously, only slightly more than half of those people studied were fully independent of their families of origin. So I thought that's kind of interesting. This is a time when we sort of explore this and experiment. When we look at the reality here in our country, we find only about half or so uh, are fully independent by the conclusion or by 25. I thought that was interesting. So it's pretty common for college kids to stay home or young adults to stay home as long as they can uh, for various reasons. This is often described as a time of instability, being self-focused, and feeling in between. Okay, we're going to talk about each one of these. Let's start with instability. You know, this could be in terms of your work and career. We are still establishing that. Your education may be uncertain as you're still figuring that out. Your love life may be in a flux or not quite certain. In other words, during this time of our life, things, to be, things tend to be pretty unstable when we compare it to other life stages. I mean, I think certainly when I was 19 or 20, you know, things for me personally, I, I definitely agree with that, where you're, just, you're in this job that you don't really care about, or you're still trying to find the right person or trying to figure out what you want to do. Uh, it's definitely a feeling of instability. At least I can personally relate to that, in my opinion. Self-focused. So in terms of other life stages in adulthood, uh, this is one of our most self-focused stages of all time. So many of these young adults have few responsibilities and thus possibly have freedom to be autonomous and focus on themselves. Now remember, this doesn't apply to everyone, certainly not, because life may have dealt you a completely different hand. So it kind of depends on the person's scenario. I think that's important to understand. But if we look at the averages, most people are pretty self-focused during this time, whether it's about me, I'm developing my career, I'm developing who I am. You know, it's very sort of inner focus compared to other life stages. Emerging adulthood is also a time of feeling in between. So in other words, you may not consider yourself a child or a teenager anymore, but it may not, you may not feel like a, feel, a full fledged adult yet. So it's almost, it's kind of like this weird transition where you're, you've gotten through puberty, you've gotten through high school, you become an adult, but you're not quite there yet. You're sort of, you know, emerging into that. So it, uh, studies show that young adults often report feelings of being just in between, not quite right yet. Research also has revealed that during this time of emerging adulthood, it's an age of possibility in which individuals have an opportunity to transform their lives. Remember, we're talking about 18 to 25 here. So theoretically, there are two different ways that emerging adulthood could be this age of possibility. Number one, you may feel really optimistic about your future during this time of your life. In other words, the sky is the limit. I can do anything I want. I have all these avenues that are wide open for me. So it may have a feeling, it may bring a feeling that the sky is the limit and I can do anything I want. So that's what, kind of what we mean by that. Number two, uh, we may reorient our lives if we started out rough in a more positive direction. In other words, your life may have started rough for various reasons. And now this gives you an opportunity to get back on track or to completely change things, the freedom to do that, or now you can start to kind of hone in on what you actually want to do as a person. Okay, so once again, let's just repeat those, feeling optimistic about your future, but also having the opportunity to completely reorient or change your life in some way. All right, 
That's what the, the research is showing with Jeffrey Arnett in 2006. However, every theory has its critics. So we're going to look at that. The critics are going to say, well, that, that makes sense. That's really nice uh, information there. But this information really only applies to privileged adolescents who can afford to do this. And I completely uh, understand what they're trying to say here. In other words, not every young adult, 18 to 25, has the freedom to find themselves, to explore the age of possibility, that kind of thing. Let's say that you're, you became a parent as a teenager. That's a completely different life course than someone who doesn't have those strings attached. What if you grow up in poverty, or you live in poverty, or your, your, your living circumstances are very limited? Uh, thus, you can't sort of have the same freedom or opportunities that privileged uh, adults may have. In other words, you may be working two jobs because you have to do that. Your parents aren't helping you. You're completely by yourself at this point, so you don't have the freedom of that opportunity to decide everything and to understand that, wow, the sky's the limit. It's kind of you're forced into a certain uh, pattern of life, if you would. So thus, the critics are saying this may not apply to every single person, and I think they have a very valid point with that. Okay, I'll let you guys make up your own mind uh, whether you agree with that or not. So this will conclude our short lecture here. Uh, please go on to the next step in the class.